All right, we are live. Hello, everybody. Michael Batiste from the Elk Calling Academy, where we give you the blueprint for success in the Elk Woods. Welcome back to Wapiti Wednesday Q and A. Um, we're trying out the new go live button on YouTube. So, uh, if you guys jump in, the chat's enabled. Just let me know that you can hear everything just fine. Because, like I said, this is this is kind of a test run with that new go live button within YouTube. So, all right. So tonight's Wapiti Wednesday Q and A, um, we are answering a question from our Facebook page. Um, Keith Oles submitted this question and Keith wants to know what kind of calling strategy would you use calling over slash near a watering hole and would it change for early season when it's much hotter to late season after we've received some moisture? So, um, Keith, great question. So, you know, water holes can be really, really effective. Um, and I'm also going to lump in their wallows. Wallows and water holes, especially during the early season when it is really, really hot, are, are, are very effective to hunt during that midday portion when it is really, you know, temps are up there a little bit, you know, they're coming in and getting water during the middle of the day or coming in to roll in a wallow to regulate their, their temperature. The important thing is though, you have to make sure that you actually found fresh tracks around that water hole uh, or around that wallow. So that's a good indication that elk are actually in the area and your chances of them actually coming to that water hole or wallow are a lot higher. So obviously if there aren't any elk in the area, then you could sit on that water hole or that wallow um, day after day and no elk are gonna come in. I mean, you might get a straggler or some, you know, an elk wandering through. Now, the one thing that I like to do is I like to tell a little story. Um, I'm not one to just sit there quiet, just waiting for something to come in. So I kind of want to force something to happen. Now, usually within that water source or that wallow, there's going to be a trail or two coming in. So before I actually sit, I'm going to do a few different things. One of them is I'm going to take a stick and I'm going to tie some string to it. And then I'm going to take a feminine hygiene product and I'm going to tie that onto the string. And then what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to soak that in cow and heat urine. Um, and then I'm going to go up the trail a little ways leading to that water source or leading to that wallow. And I'm going to drag that down that trail. Now, the key thing is, is don't walk on the trail because believe it or not, as you walk on that trail, you're leaving some scent from your boots on that trail. So I always stay off to the side of the trail. Um, I'll stay on the downwind side. And that's why I use that stick. So I hold my arm out. I've got the stick out. And I'm a good six to seven feet away from that trail, dragging this drag. Now, there are drags on the market. They they make them for, you know, deer hunting that you can use as well. Um, cow and heat urine. Uh, Boar Masters makes a, a really good cow and heat urine. Um, but main thing is soak that drag so that you're dispersing. Another, um, if you can find the cow and heat gel, that works really, really well because it's kind of thicker and it almost globs off a little bit in the dirt and will work a little bit on that drag. So, so I'm going to do that drag first thing. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a decoy. Um, the decoy that I really like for this is the rump from Montana decoy. Reason being is there is no head, there is no ears. Um, all they see is the rump. They can't see the head, they can't make the eye contact, and they can't just sit there waiting for an ear to flick or this or that. Now that I've done the drag and I've done the um, the decoy, so hey, Big Daddy Bleach, thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on tonight. So. Um, now I'm going to do a little bit of light calling and basically I'm going to do, you know, kind of a 
just a few different cow sounds, a few, you know, mews, uh, some chirps, maybe some assembly mews. Um, I, what I'm trying to do is really kind of paint a picture of a breeding sequence kind of going on. So I'm going to do those few cow sounds. I'm going to pick up a stick. I'm going to do some light raking. And then I, I'm just going to kind of throw out um, a bugle or two. Um, nothing, you know, real aggressive, just some nice relaxed bugles. And then I'm going to wait and I'm going to listen. So this is, this is almost like what you're doing is almost, uh, oh, Jim Horn a few years back talked about a silent calling routine. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're painting this picture around this water hole or this, this wallow that, you know, there's a cow that's coming into cycle. There's a bull that's right there. And a lot of times it can entice that bull that's bedded nearby to come in and take a check because he's, he's, he's going to want a scent check. And that's why it's kind of nice that you did that scent drag and that scent drag. I mean, I, I went 60, 75 yards out from that wall over that water source to start this drag. So by you kind of doing this breeding sequence with the sounds, it's going to entice that bull to get up and start coming down the trail towards that water hole. And then man, as soon as he hits that scent drag, he's like, yeah, there is a hot cow down there. I'm, I'm smelling her urine in the trail. And then as he starts getting a little closer, then he's going to be able to see that decoy, that rump. So, so now we've, we've hit all three of his senses. We've hit his hearing, we've hit his smell, and now we've sent his, you know, we, we've hit his visual. Um, those three things right there. Now, when I set up, I'm not by the decoy. I'm actually positioned myself on the downwind side so that when he comes in that trail, I mean, he's, he's locked on that scent drag. He's locked on that decoy. Um, you know, when I, when I did my, my breeding sequence, I actually did my sounds right up near that decoy. So his full attention is all on that. He has no clue. I'm sitting there waiting to ambush. Um, now, and, and, and it may be that, you know, you do your first round of calls and you wait five minutes and then you do that round of calls again, and then you wait five minutes. Now, while I'm sitting there, I'm listening for telltale signs of an elk coming in. I uh, may maybe a snap of a twig. You know, it could be that that hoof skipping across a rock or on a rock. It could be a antler ticking off a branch. I mean, there's there's a lot of sounds that a lot of times we don't pay attention to. But when you're sitting there at that that water hole or that wallow, you really really want to pay attention. Um, cause a lot of times they won't get up and just bugle their way in, especially early in the season. They're going to come in silent to find out who's hanging out at their water hole or, or their wallow. Um, now if you have more than one trail coming in, you do that drag on each of those trails uh, let's see if you do cow calls and a young bugle and make it seem like he's breeding, will it make a bigger bull mad and come in? Um, you know, big daddy, it, it, it could, um, you know, especially on wallows. Sometimes, you know, bulls are kind of territorial or territorial of their wallows because, you know, they're in those wallows, they're peeing in that wallow, they're thrashing in that mud, they're rolling in that mud. That's what's getting, you know, their scent really on them to attract the cows. And so, a bigger mature herd bull can sometimes get, uh, you know, territorial of those areas. So that's why I said, if he's bedded down close by and you're doing this breeding sequence and he's thinking, dang it, there's another bull that came into my area with a cow that's coming in hot. He's going to want to check it out. And that's why I said that drag is, is, is so effective because as soon as he starts coming in, he's already hearing the sounds of the breeding sequence. He knows what that breeding sequence sounds like and what's going on with that. And he's going to want to scent check the air. He's going to want to check that cow for himself. And then, um, you know, he hits that drag. He smells that urine. He knows that cow's in heat. He's really not going to be happy with another bull trying to breed a cow in his area. So it can work on that dominance. So, um, now, you know, the question that I get a lot of times, how long do I sit over wallow or a water source or how long do I sit over a wallow? 
that's one of the things that's really, really tough for me because I love calling elk. I love hearing bugles. I love interacting with them. And my mind is wired that while I'm sitting there, especially early season over this wallow, my mind is telling me, dang it, on the backside of that ridge, there's a bull bugling. I know for a fact there's a bull bugling. You should abandon sitting in this spot and you should hike up to the top of that ridge and get that bull on the backside that's bugling. And then, of course, you get up to the top of the ridge, you get on the backside, and there's not a bull bugling on there. Oh, well, maybe he's over that next ridge, you, you know. So, so for me, it's really, really tough to hunt water sources um, and uh, um, wallows, but they can be really, really effective. I have, I have some other things that, you know, I teach uh, to the students in the private lessons along with that, that breeding sequence. So, um, for those of you that don't know the Elk Calling Academy, we do offer one-on-one -on -one lessons to where we really go into depth on a lot of the sounds that I talk about in these videos. And, and I teach you those. And I even open up the playbook and teach you exactly how I use those sounds out there. Um, Tyler, can you do a quick cow chirp compared to an assembly mew? Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the chirp is really just a short form of the mew. where the assembly mew, you, you, you kind of focus more on the bottom end. So Tyler, there's just a quick little breakdown. Um, if you, if, if you want to get more in depth in that, just, just kind of get a hold of me and we can, we can set up a, uh, a lesson and kind of go through that a little more. Um, for those of you guys that don't live in the Boise area, the nice thing about the lessons is I use Zoom video conference, so we still get the face-to-face -face time. And the cool thing is I record that, so when I'm done, actually uh, send it over to you. Perfect. Okay. Glad that helped, Tyler. So, Okay, so that's basically how I like to hunt water sources and wallows. Uh, second part of the question, uh, does my approach change early season versus, you know, later in the season. Honestly, I don't hunt water and wallows late in the season because usually later on in the season, the ruts really, you know, we're in the peak of the rut. So there's a lot of rutting activity and kind of running and gunning and working bulls. Um, so that, that middle part of the day, I, uh, um, I'm, I'm recharging, you know, I'm fueling up, getting rehydrating and then getting ready to get after it again in the, in, in the evening time. So, so really water sources and wallows for me are kind of the first part of the season. So big daddy, why should I pay for a CD when I can watch your videos for free? Uh, because actually what I cover in the paid lessons is actually um, a lot more in depth, a lot more detail, a lot more hands-on. Um, really, really go through the proper diaphragm placement and really, really break down all the sounds and the meanings and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, we will actually uh, have a website coming out soon where you guys will have access to a lot of the stuff that we teach in these lessons also. So, but um, hopefully I'm giving you guys enough info in this stuff to, to kind of help you along a, a little bit. That's, that's the main goal here is, is to kind of, kind of help the lessons and stuff or for those individuals that really want to take it to the next level. So, but anyway, guys, so Keith, I hope that answers your question. So tonight's video is actually sponsored by nature's paint. So I actually have a nature's paint kit for you, Keith. So get a hold of me, get me your address and I will get this out to you. Um, Friday night's video, Beginner's Guide to Elk Calling. We are actually going to cover reed tuning. And I'm gonna show you guys exactly how to tune a diaphragm reed to get the perfect fit, perfect fit in the roof of your mouth uh, to really maximize your sounds and calls. So anyways, Keith, hope that answers your question. Guys, keep the questions rolling in. We've got some excellent questions here in the last few days. It's, it's awesome, but we appreciate your guys' support. Thank you for tuning in tonight on this little test of the new go live stream. Um, and as always guys, keep practicing, keep calling, but most of all, have fun 
And we'll see you guys next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A brought to you by Elk Calling Academy. Have a great night, guys.